Check one, two. There we go. My name is Jonathan, one of the pastors here at Temple Baptist Church. Thank you, Rebirth Homes, for coming on out. Friends and family, please uh, take the time to visit their table immediately following the service and just support them in any way possible. Um, this is missionary work taking place in our own backyard here in the city of Riverside. And so we want to do all that we can as a church to support them. Um, but anyways, this morning we are continuing on in our Advent series called The Greatest Story Ever Told. And we are working our way through the story of the birth of Jesus. And for those who were with us a couple weeks back, Tom, who is one of our elders uh, he, and pastors, he's not here this morning. He kicked off our series and we were in Matthew chapter 1. And we touched on Jesus' genealogy and the significance of that. We learned how Mary would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Shocking, I know. Joseph sure was. And we went over how an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and was told that he would father the Messiah, the Savior. The Savior of what? Jesus would save people from their sins and his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Now, the fact that you have prophecy being fulfilled, a virgin birth, a Messiah who would save people from their sins, if that is not a great story, then I do not know what is. But this morning, we'll continue on as we unfold even further this great story, the beauty of God's redemptive story is indeed great, and it begins with the birth of Jesus. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. We have a Bible located right there in front of the pew. If you do not have a Bible, we will also have uh, the passage up on the screen. But we are in Matthew chapter 2. We will be uh, reading verses 1 through 12, and we will read a familiar story this morning. I'm sure all of you have probably heard, but before we do, I just want to ask that you would just join me in a word of prayer, and so let's come before the Lord, let's bow our hearts, and let's pray together. Glorious Father, gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, Lord, that we're able to gather this morning. God, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. We come before you, Lord, seeking the Messiah. We come before you worshiping you, King Jesus, and I pray, Lord, that after today, after this passage, just works at our hearts, I pray, God, that we would see you in all your glory, and who you really are, and what you came to do here on this earth. I pray that you would speak to us now, be with my family, brothers and sisters in the faith, and may you speak to us through your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We're going to work our way through this passage, uh, verse at a time. Starting in verse 1, it says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And we'll stop right there. Now these events that we just read took place after Jesus was born. How long after is unknown, but later we will read in verse 11, it describes Joseph and Mary now living in a house. They have left their temporary lodging place. They're not there. Jesus is not there in a manger anymore. That's described to us in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And in verse 9 and 11, and we'll get there shortly, we have uh, the word child mentioned instead of baby. And we'll get to those verses again here shortly. Further, later tonight, for our candlelight service, we will read how Herod issues a decree to kill all children to and under. But more on that later tonight. But the point is, the birth of Jesus was not recent. 
Now, I know we have the nativity scenes and we have the figures out in our homes, right? Some of us have them outside as inflatables on the yard. I guess that's the, that's the thing now, to have these inflatables out on their yard. I'm seeing them everywhere in our neighborhood with a fresh baby Jesus in a manger. But I'm sorry to ruin Christmas, but that was not probably the case. Now, please don't go taking them down or trespassing people's yards and removing these nativity scenes. Unless, unless, unless you have a nativity scene set at home and your baby Jesus is like pale and white, it's time to, it's time for you to get a new set. Like I've seen that. It's just like kind of creepy. Get a new set. But don't take them down. It's great. But it's just not an accurate picture according to what the Bible teaches. Jesus has grown into a child, and this child, Jesus, was born in Bethlehem. Now, I want to provide for you a few details about this town, Bethlehem. Now, all of you have heard the town Bethlehem come up quite a bit within these months. We are familiar with the town as we studied the book of Ruth, if you remember, Boaz marries Ruth in Bethlehem. It's also the place where Jacob, if you know your Bible, Jacob in Genesis buried Rachel. It's also the place where there are many prophecies told about Bethlehem in the Old Testament. It's even come up in our benedictions. This town is best known in Jesus' day as the hometown of King David. It's a small, humble little town, yet it's the city or town of champions, you could say. Bethlehem means house of bread. Beth is house, Lehem is bread. Jesus, who is the bread of life, was born in Bethlehem. Fitting town, fitting name for a Messiah, right? Now, this city is about six to seven miles south from Jerusalem. It was probably a two-hour walk, roughly, in Jesus' day. The town was known for its fertile ground and lush fields. Again, think the book of Ruth. Remember Ruth gleaning in the fields? This town was known to have several shepherds. Shepherds would raise flocks of sheep in this town. In Luke 2, we are told that it's in this region that shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. And look what happens in Luke chapter 2, verse 9. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, or Bethlehem, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, is known as the Great Shepherd. During Passover week, people would flock to Bethlehem to purchase a lamb to celebrate the Passover meal. Again, because of the lush fields, because of the many shepherds and the flocks of sheep. Jesus is the perfect and spotless lamb that came from Bethlehem and was later sacrificed for us to atone for sins. This was the village that the people of God had long expected their Messiah to be born. We are given countless prophecies in the Old Testament. Someone greater than David would soon come. God's people waited for the Messiah to be born there. And when the time came, they completely missed it. Like Tom had mentioned a few weeks back, the Jews knew the scriptures, but were not ready for the first advent or coming of Christ, but not a certain group of men as we will find out shortly. But now I want to focus our attention, address a certain individual mentioned to us in verse 1 by a guy named Herod. Now Herod in verse 1 tells, that, tells us that all of these things took place in the days of King Herod. Now I, I love the detail. It's a simple, small detail here. But the Bible is not a mere book. It's history. You have a real guy by the name of Herod who was ruling during the time of Jesus' birth. 
Herod, also known as Herod the Great, ruled as king from 37 to 4 BC. Now listen to this. He was a figure of heroic proportions. This was the guy who rebuilt the temple of Jerusalem and was considered a major feat of ancient architecture at the time. Herod was a builder. He built many projects in the city of Jerusalem. He was a half-Jew who weaseled his way into power. He sucked up to Rome and ascended to power to rule over Israel during this time. However, this guy, he was not a nice guy at all. He was a tyrant. He was cruel. He was ruthless. This was the man who would put into place oppressive taxes on and forced labor from the Israelites to build for him. As this man grew older, he became increasingly paranoid and fearful about threats against his person and his throne. The guy just loved power. He had numerous sons, wives, plural, and others close to him put to death because he feared plots to overthrow him. He was a wicked, evil man. And then now we come to the wise men. I want to address the wise men. Our text says wise men. However, they were considered magi. Matthew calls Herod's visitors magi. And who are the magi? Magi is the name of a certain kind of magician or sorcerer from Babylon. It would be present-day Iraq for us. These magi were astrologers who served in the court of the king of Babylon for centuries, actually. Oh, and by the way, these group of men at the time, they did not have a king ruling over them, which is interesting. As We will continue on with this text. But it's important to note that these wise men or magi were not kings, I know we have Christmas songs, We Three Kings. They were not kings. They were not kings themselves. They were a tribe. They were priests, and they were highly religious people who were considered somewhat, you know, pagan. And we can trace the Magi all the way back to the time of Nebuchadnezzar and the book of Daniel in the Old Testament about 600 years before Christ. Now, if you know the story of Daniel, you know that Daniel rose to power and became a leader or a ruler over these people. And it's safe to say that Daniel was a major influence on the Magi, I'm sure while in Babylon. Being the kind of man that Daniel was and his character, we know that Daniel worshipped Jehovah God while serving in the court. Daniel for sure would have taught the people about God and to anticipate the arrival of the Messiah, of Jesus. Daniel was seeking the welfare of the city God had placed him in by sharing with the Gentile world the truth about God and soon to come, king. These foreign Gentile group of men would have understood the power of Israel's God and of his promise to save them by his Messiah. Matthew says that, These magi came from the east, which confirms that they came from, indeed, Mesopotamia. Now, check this detail out. This means these magi, these wise men, traveled about 700 miles. Think about that. 700 miles to do what? To worship the king. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising And have come to worship him. These magi are in town to worship the one true king, the king of the Jews. Now, if you're Herod, and everything I told you about the guy up until this point, can you imagine Herod's face when he heard them asking to see the king of the Jews? These guys had some nerve asking King Herod where they could find the king. And remember, Herod lived his entire life in fear, fear of losing his power. I mean, this guy is getting old and he wants to remain in power and he will go to great lengths to do so. Clearly, this would have upset him. 
And it did, as we will soon find out. However, Matthew is telling us that the true king of the Jews was born during the reign of a false king of the Jews. The prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, and Hosea, they all speak of a king to come. Matthew opens up his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus as the son of David, emphasizing Jesus' kingship. He also emphasizes his kingship with the birth narrative. And again, we looked at that two weeks ago in chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, relating Jesus with King David. Matthew's theme of his gospel is to present Jesus as king. And just on a side note, there's an interesting detail. You can learn a lot from the genealogies or lack thereof in each of the Gospels. In Mark's Gospel, there is no genealogy in the book of Mark. There's no genealogy. However, the theme is servant. Mark represents Jesus as the suffering servant, so lineage was not important there in that book. In Luke's Gospel, Luke was written to give a reliable and precise record of Jesus' life, revealing his humanity. In Luke's genealogy, it goes backwards and points Jesus going back to Adam, the son of Adam. Jesus is the son of man, emphasizing his humanity. And lastly, in John's gospel, he is presented as the son of God. Now, there, there is no genealogy in the gospel of John. In the gospel of John. Instead, we get, boom, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John addresses to us that Christ is eternal there in the beginning of that book. Jesus' deity is emphasized all over the book of John. It discloses his, uh, Jesus' divine nature, one with his Father. But Matthew again presents Jesus as king. In verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. This is why Herod and all of Israel was disturbed. He was disturbed because Jesus would become a threat, a threat to his power. But I'm sure he was also afraid of these magi, these wise men who came from a foreign land and just showed up at his door. And by the way, it wasn't just three wise men. Most likely, it was probably a caravan of wise men. We're talking about dozens, if not possibly hundreds of magi just rolling up into the city of Jerusalem. It was not just three. It was probably a large group of men, an entourage of magi. And a big group like that coming into a small city like Jerusalem would have turned many heads, I'm sure, People were probably freaking out. Who are these foreign men? Look at all these people. My goodness, what is going to happen? What is going to take place? Rome dominated pretty much all of the west of Israel. They were the superpower of the world during that time. And these magi, they came from the east, Medo-Persia. And they dominated and controlled much of everything east of Israel. And so Herod is disturbed the people of Jerusalem were deeply disturbed. Another war might break out. And what happens next? Let's read verse 4. Let's continue on with the text. Verse 4. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In verse 5. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophets. And you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now Herod, being a half-Jew himself, he knew some Bible, I'm sure. He probably knew some scripture, right? He knows that there's probably a Messiah coming. He even asked the question, where would Messiah be born again? Some versions would say, depending on your Bible, would say, where would the Christ be born? He has some knowledge. However, his knowledge is not sufficient. 
He's not completely sure. And so what does he do? He calls in the experts. He calls in the chief priests and the scribes, as verse 4 states. The scribes or, or teachers of the law. These guys knew their stuff. These scribes would spend all day copying the holy scriptures word by word, line by line. They were professional Bible scholars and teachers. They didn't have to open to Micah to know in which town the Messiah would be born. Verse 6 is in reference to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, just so you know. Pastor Jeremy shared a benediction out of Micah a few weeks back. It's not surprising that they knew the answer, these scribes. It would be a shame on them if they actually didn't know the answer. That is not shocking, but I'll tell you what is shocking. What is shocking is this. Though they knew the answer, they did nothing with the answer. The chief priests and scribes knew their Bible better than they lived their Bible. Unlike the Magi, the foreigners who traveled from afar to worship Jesus, these religious experts answered and went back to bury their heads in the word of God. I love how Paul puts it in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7, they were always learning, always learning, and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. They weren't even curious. Could this be the one of whom the scriptures testify? Could this be the Messiah? Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. All of this to say that the church is full of people like this. Knowledge of God doesn't save you. It's what you do with that truth that does. Friend, do you seek? Do you worship the one true king? Do you submit to him as king and Lord over, you, or Lord over your life? You see, many people in the church know the Christmas story. They know that it's about the birth of Christ. They know the story of the wise men, but don't really know the true Messiah himself. One commentator put it like this, and I love this. He said this, Sure, there are people in the world who are indifferent to Jesus. They know he was born in Bethlehem. His mother's name was Mary. He did miracles. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. They know all of this, and they just don't care. There are lots of people like that in the world. But, he says this, but there are also lots of people like that in the church. If you've quizzed them on Bible trivia, they do just fine. But if you inform them God in the flesh is just five miles down the street, would you care to join me to meet him? They would shake their heads and say, oh, no, not this time. You know, the NFL playoffs start today. I'm sorry. Or it's the last day of this unbelievable New Year's sale. Or I'd hate to miss my Sunday afternoon nap, maybe next time. You know, it's around Christmas time where thousands upon thousands of people, they pack their church everywhere. Both from the church and people of the world, but live as though there is no king upon the throne but them. They are each their own king, and they do whatever is fitting in their own eyes. And so what is Herod's next move? Let's read verse 7, verse 7 and 8. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go worship him. So after summoning all the religious leaders together, now Herod summons the wise men secretly. He summons the Magi secretly. This guy is up to no good. This guy is straight up scheming. He wants to know exactly the time when this star appeared. He needs an exact date. For what reason? Well, we will find out later tonight. Um, but he's up to no good. I mean, this story is just going to get better and better. So you guys better come out to candlelight later tonight. 
Dan's going to be uh, sharing a message out of that to wrap up this series. But this guy tells the wise men that he wants to worship. Herod wants to worship Jesus. Um, yeah, right. Ah, fake. What a complete hypocrite. I mean, this guy is just straight up acting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to send you to Bethlehem uh, because I want to worship him too. Such a great actor. Give this guy an Oscar. Verse 9. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Now hold up, hold up, times, 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 times. I haven't really talked about the star up until this point. And I think we probably should. We have Christmas trees and we place stars on top of our trees. But it's interesting that the star is not visible at all until we get to verse 9 again. I mean, if you read the text carefully, the Magi saw it in the east back in verse 2. They saw it at its rising, right? And then it just completely vanished. Boom, gone. The star is gone. And they haven't seen it since. And in verse 2, the text simply says that the star, again, just rose. And then they began their journey to Judea. These wise men, these magi. And they stopped in Jerusalem asking where the Messiah would be born. Because the star was not there to guide them as popular belief goes. The Magi only knew the words of Daniel at best. They hadn't read the words of Micah. So these men don't know where in Judea the king would be born. So they do the next best thing. They stop and check in with Herod. They assumed Herod must know where his own successor would be, right? And so obviously this is not an ordinary star. It appears, it vanishes, it's gone, and then it appears again. Highly doubt it was a planet or some comet or some celestial thing. In fact, given how it behaves, it wasn't a star at all. The only reasonable explanation for this, I'm going to blow your minds, for a bright light that moves over the sin of God would be the Shekinah glory of God. That's the name for the brightness that accompanies the glory of God. Remember, I read Luke chapter 2, verse 9 earlier. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. This is the Shekinah glory. And in verse 9, the Shekinah glory reappears to guide the Magi to Bethlehem. And in verse 10, it says that they rejoiced over seeing the star again. They rejoiced over seeing the glory of God again. Listen, the last time men witnessed the glory of God, and I love these details. I was preparing for this passage and I was studying. This was something new that, you know, I learned this week. But the last time men witnessed the glory of God was at its departure from the temple of Jerusalem shortly before Babylon destroyed the city. And you can read all about it in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 10, the glory of God departing. In Ezekiel chapter 10, when Jerusalem was destroyed before Babylon destroyed it. But then because of Israel's sin, it departed. And for over 600 years, it's been gone up until now. And now after 600 years, check this out, it returns being accompanied by Babylonian magi. Babylon destroyed Jerusalem. Glory of God left. Now the glory comes back accompanied by Babylonian magi. What a trip. And when I learned that, I was like, whoa, I was blown away. But the star, the Shekinah glory reappears and then moves with them until it eventually rests on the house of Mary and Joseph. 
So that explains how the Magi found the Christ, the star, the Shekinah glory of God, led them to him. And what happens next is remarkable. We're going to close out these verses together. Verse 11 and 12 says this, Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Now these wise men, these magi, entered the home. They fell on their knees and they worshipped. The Greek word that is used here for worship in verse 11 is proskuneo. It means to fall face down, prostrating oneself before persons and kissing their feet or the hem of their garments. These magi fell face down and worshipped at Jesus' feet, this child. And out of their worship, they presented costly gifts fitted for a king. They gave out of their joy and out of their worship with deep adoration, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. People who recognize Jesus for who he is as king will worship, and out of their joy and out of their adoration in their worship will give generously. Usually, generous givers are the ones that usually recognize the Messiah and they know They know who he is. They know the worth and the value. And these magi came and worshipped this child. Gold is symbolic of royalty. Kings wear gold. Kings wear gold crowns. It's an expensive element for sure. You know that. Some of you have probably bought gold gifts for loved ones for Christmas. Jesus is royal. He is king. Frankincense is symbolic of priesthood. Priests would use frankincense for for temple worship. It was a sweet incense that would rise to God. Jesus is our high priest. He is king. He is priest. Myrrh. Myrrh was also a pleasant scent like frankincense. It was a type of perfume. It was used to cover up any foul smell or preserve a dead body. Myrrh pointed to the death of Christ, pointed to his humanity, gold, king, frankincense. Hey, he's priest, he's divine, he's deity, but he's also human. Myrrh. And these were lavish, generous gifts for sure. But you know what the greatest gift is in these last verses that we can so easily miss? The greatest gift was not the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The greatest gift was obeying God and sparing the life of Jesus. I'll say that again. The greatest gift was obeying God and sparing the life of Jesus. These magi were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Remember, Herod summoned these magi secretly because he wanted to worship Jesus. But as we will find out again later tonight, it was really so that he can kill the Messiah. But the magi didn't bow down or listen to an earthly king a mere mortal man. Instead, they worshiped, adored the one true king and obeyed God and in doing so spared the life of the Messiah. Friends, you don't need gold. You don't need frankincense. You don't need myrrh to worship King Jesus. You can worship the Lord with genuine adoration and with great joy. You can worship the Lord with your obedience. God is pleased and God desires obedience over sacrifice. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Listen, wise men worship in this way. There are three clear ways that you can respond to the Messiah. 
this Christmas season. First, we can choose indifference. We can choose indifference. This is the choice made by the Jewish religious leaders. They showed no interest. They showed no concern to the arrival of Jesus. Some people are like that today. They see Jesus. They see Jesus' birth as something in the past. It's no big deal. It's not even relevant today in our culture. Oh, that's that's cute. That's a nice story. It's probably just myth, fairy tale. Jesus is not relevant today anyway. Secondly, you can respond like Herod and be hostile. There are people who want nothing to do with Christ. They are angry with God, if I'm honest. They see God as someone who ruins their plans or someone who interferes with their life. What do you mean I can't do this, God, and I can't do that? They see Jesus as a threat to their way of living. Like Herod did. Or lastly, you can choose to be like the Magi and worship. Listen, both indifference and hostility reject Jesus and his rule. But worship, worship draws us near to receive him. In closing, one of my favorite Christmas songs is is Silent Night. And there's a line in there that says, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. The Magi, having traveled over 700 miles, I mentioned earlier. Think about that. Let's just, let's just take a moment to think about this very quickly. This is a long distance. That is a long distance. No cars. 700 miles, traveling through the desert during the day and sleeping at night in the wilderness. It was dangerous, for sure. You were exposed to robbers and thieves. You had wildlife. The desert elements, for sure, would have made things uncomfortable for them. But to them, it didn't matter. No distance was too great. No gift too expensive. They were willing to make the journey and worship because they knew the Savior of the world was born. These Gentile, foreign, pagan men who were probably not very presentable, if we're honest. I mean, traveling for that length of time, you're not going to look the same. You're probably not going to smell the same. uh, These magi... I mean, their robes were probably filled with dirt and grime. Sure, they probably had other clothes with them, but it's not like they could take the time and really wash their clothes. I mean, this was probably the first ugly, first ugly Christmas sweater gathering of all time. I like my sweater, by the way. Now you guys know how old I am, roughly. You guys know the Ninja Turtles. But to them, it didn't matter. They traveled that length of time. Because when they arrived at the house and they saw Jesus, the Messiah, they knew that night that they could sleep in heavenly peace. That's what makes the birth of Christ the greatest story ever told. This is the gospel, friends, that we can come to God with our filth. We can come to God with our sin. And if we repent and believe that Jesus is king, you will have peace. Peace knowing that your sins are forgiven. You will have shalom peace. That's the Hebrew word for peace. It's harmony. It means wholeness. It means completeness, welfare. It means tranquility. Not peace, the absence of conflict, but peace that surpasses all understanding. Peace with God the Father. It's a peace that no matter what happens in this life, there is a life to come that is far greater, far more glorious, and a life to look forward to. And Jesus went through great lengths. There was no harmony for him when he came to this earth, when he abandoned his glory. There was no tranquility in his life being rejected by his own, even by his own family. 
There was no wholeness. There was no welfare. And Jesus went all that for me and for you so that we can understand and know what true peace is. You know, for some of us in this room, our gatherings aren't the same. It's not the same when you lose a loved one. I know several people in this room have lost loved ones, me included. And sometimes this is the hardest time of year for a lot of people. But what makes Christmas great, because of what Christ did on the cross, we are able to see and gather and be with family once again. But you have to be made whole. Christ must be your peace. And he must be your king. And friend, if you're joining us this morning for the first time and you do not know Jesus, Jesus is king. And if you come before him and you worship and you repent of your sin and you say, Lord, you are a king, you will be forgiven of your sin. And you will have the peace of Christ live in you. That's what Christmas is all about. Peace has come. Peace is here. I'm going to call up my friend Carlos. We're going to worship the Lord here in just a moment, but I want for us to pray. Can we go ahead and let's pray as we just close out this service together?